Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I've known Peter Goldmark since he was 29 years old and the chief of Mayor Lindsay's staff some 45 years ago. Since then, he's enjoyed remarkable careers in the worlds of government, philanthropy, journalism, and environmental science. He's now a weekly columnist for Newsday, and he says he's an independent consultant and troublemaker. But I think he could be president. I do, and he's my guest today. So welcome. Hello, Ronnie. It's fun to be here. God, you've really had some careers, a lot of careers. I've really been lucky, and on some of them, I was not, I was not only lucky on the job, I was lucky on the moment in history. If you take That's budget director of New York State, that's a great job anytime because, yeah. remember, New York State is where Al Smith invented the executive budget system. Yeah. So it's a job with a lot of power and reach. But yeah. I had, that job's existed for 200 years, and I had the three most interesting. Yeah. We were bailing out in New York the City. It was the crisis right. uh, with Kerry. With Hugh Kerry was the governor. Right. 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 And then you went, well, you were interested in City Hall also. It was interesting. Yes. Right. Great years. And then, and then you go on to the, what, Rockefeller Foundation? That's where, that's a yeah. couple of jobs later, go President to Massachusetts for Human Services. That's right, Secretary. Then, uh, then, then come back uh, to and Budget publishing. Director and then the Port Authority. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but you've had all of these things, so it, when I say why didn't you run for, you should run for President, is you've, you've attacked all the, the world problems from every point of view. It's very, uh -huh. it's really unique, isn't it? It's very interesting. It's it's been a lot of fun and I feel a great privilege. But yeah. you know, Ronnie, you and I grew up in a period after World War II when some days, if you were American, all you had to do was fall out of bed and breathe to be ahead. Yeah, that's I mean, true. We were, we were just, things were going right for this country. And we also thought we could really change the world. We did, and we did in some respects. Yeah. I remember the year after the Marshall Plan was passed, being overseas, and an old lady crossed the street and she came up to me and she said, Mr. Goldmar, didn't, not Mr. Goldmar, sir, I think you're an American, and if you are, I want you to go back and tell everybody we are really thankful. This is Europe after the war. This is Europe. It hasn't happened lately. No, it years. hasn't. It's too bad. It really is. Yeah. So I, w there are two things I really want to talk to you about. I mean, one is the Port Authority because it's so interesting now with the way it is and the way it should be, and the other is um, global warming, but we'll come to that in the climate. We'll come to that later, all right? Good. Let's talk about the Port Authority. You were the executive director of the Port Authority. Yes. And you came from Hugh Carey. He was the governor because he knew you. You were the budget director. Yes. Very good. And, he th and you knew you had experience running it. You knew budgets. You knew everything, basically, that was, would go into being a good director. So now you look at the Port Authority, and what do you think? It's, <laughs> it's sad for me to look at the Port Authority because the region and the Port Authority do best when the states play to its strengths. So what are the strengths of the Port Authority? I think the way to look at the Port Authority is as an engine of investment. They can raise capital, they can put it to work for good projects for the region, and I stress region because the two states don't need more state agencies. Right. They have hundreds of state agencies and authorities. But this one looks out for the metropolitan region as a whole, which is knit together in, in so many ways, as you know. So it's an engine of investment. It can raise money, and guess what? It's self-supporting. If it, it left alone. It's self-supporting financially, yeah. even today. Even when you it don't is. have to collect taxes at the states to send mm -hmm. to the Port Authority, mm -hmm. even though they have a mass transit system, even though they're in some fields which don't make money, they cross-subsidize. So a place that makes money, like the airports, is used to offset losses in a place like the PATH commuter mm -hmm. system. But it, I mean, it was formed basically by Congress, or it was formed by the governments, but with con congressional approval. That's right. So it's not so easy to just come up with an idea that these governors talk about that we're just going to change it. That is not very easy at it's all. It's a little and, disingenuous. But it's also not what we need. This is the biggest and most vital metropolitan area in the country. Now, what's one of the biggest problems the cities and the states of our mm -hmm. populated areas have? It's crumbling infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Well, who's better than an engine of investment to go to work on that? So you have, you have something that other parts of the country envy. They come here, Ronnie, to study the Port Authority. And some of it's, them I, I remember, you know, I worked for you then, basically. You were the executive director, and I worked in uh, worked government and public affairs. With Sid, yeah. But, um, and it, I was looked upon with great suspicion because I was the politician. <laughs> I never will forget that. 
and now look what we have. I mean, and I didn't really have a political sponsor because I no. was on the outs with everybody at that point. But it was Christy Whitman, I think, looking back, who started with this deputy executive director. I mean, when did the governors really begin to see it as its source for patronage jobs? Um, it, I'm told it begins to happen sometime in the 1990s. Uh, I suspect the second half, but I don't really know. But the tradition of the Port Authority uh, up until then was this is not a political agency. Right. You were hired not because somebody politically wanted you hired. You were hired because the head of your department, Sid Fergan, said this is one of the best, ablest ladies I know in community affairs and political matters. But you weren't hired because some governor called up and said right. hire elder. So that begins sometimes in the late 90s. And um, I think it, I, reading about it, because I wanted to talk about it, so I went a little bit back. Pataki appointed, I, I forget his name, George Marlin. Marlin. He appointed. And was he the head of a party? The he was a senior figure in the Conservative Party. And that was, and totally, had us all scratching and our heads. Totally not experienced for this job. I'll say it. You say it. I'm not sure the good Lord made us, any of us, smart enough to comment on our well, successes. Well, then, at that point, though, that's when Christy Whitman said, I need to have a deputy from New Jersey. Yeah. And that's, I think, opened the system. But, and, and the answer yeah. is not, as you said, to separate it. What would you do? Well, Simple. Before we go there, it has to be more, the governors certainly began it. But look at, look at what happened. Let's use slightly different words for you, said you had some weak appointments, appointments of not strong professional people, and that opens the door. But there's another question, Ronnie. Where was the board? Oh, that's some neat. Board of Commissioners has to approve all those appointments, and the Board of Commissioners in my day used to stand up to the governors sometimes. So in effect, there was a separate series of appointments that weakened mm -hmm. the Port Authority, which is you didn't have broad regional figures anymore. You had people who were put there because they would do what the governor said. So that comes in the were, same period. And also they were rewarded for their contributions and yes. closeness to the governor. Yes. I mean, it's appalling. Christy just recently said, well, I can't ask a businessman who's got so many interests to divest himself of his businesses when he's on the board. Well, that's shouldn't have been on the board to begin Exactly. That's pretty close to bunkum. If you can't be a commissioner of the Port Authority or on the board of any public agency and draw a solid, bright line between your business and your, your role on that board, you have no business being there. So do you think we're ever going to get it straightened out? We will get it straightened out when the governors want it straightened out. Can the Congress make any, um, the congressional delegations make any... Uh, contribution to the straight answer to that is probably not if yeah. they wanted to they could hold hearings mm -hmm. if they wanted a body removed from the rough-and-tumble of state politics to look into it but the idea that a polarized split Congress is going to somehow magically rework the Port Authority that's a little far-fetched I think right but I was just talking about the delegation bringing some pressure. Oh, the delegation yeah, from New Jersey and New York it's interesting because it's a good introduction to the question about climate change. I mean, you're a very outspoken person on warning about the dangers that we face. Yes. Or that are facing us right now. How do we project that? Then you, you pick up the paper and you see that in Wyoming, they're not going to allow the teaching of global warming in school curriculum. Now, so how do, you ch how do you manage to change Make it happen. There's a great contradiction, as I see it, in what they said in Wyoming. The first part of that paragraph was, <laughs> politics has no place in education. Right. And the <laughs> same statement goes on to say, we are not going to allow a certain thing to be taught. So that's that, incredible. That doesn't quite rhyme. Um, what I'm doing mostly these days when I talk about climate change to an audience, and I talked about it to an audience in Texas last week, which was really interesting. That was, <clears throat> I think we say, a lively evening with the Must San Antonio be. World Affairs Council. Oh, but I think it's very important to connect it with two issues it's not normally connected with. First one is food, and the second one is jobs. Let me take a second mm -hmm. on food. 
Uh, a question I'd love to ask audiences is, how many bottles like this does the average human being on this planet drink a day? And the answer is four. It's about four liters. Now it's a little more if you live in the Sahara Desert, it's a little less if you live in some rainy place like Scotland. But four liters, every human being every day. Then I ask the audience, how many bottles like this does it take to produce the food you eat in a day? In a day. And very few people have any idea. The answer is 2,000. So do you see how it's a different order of magnitude, the amount of water we need that goes into the food you and I and every other human being on this planet eat every day? That's where the squeeze is going to come as climate affects water through the melting of glaciers, the drying up of rivers, and other forces that are not climate driven like falling water tables. There will always be enough droughts, droughts which are, which yeah. exactly, dr yeah. droughts which are, uh, which are global warming driven. Now, let me take a second on jobs. We see the price Europe is paying for never having have a, and for not having a stimulus program when they came out of the recession of 2008. We're doing a little better, but not a little better, not a lot better. What is the biggest single thing you could do for climate change in this country? It would be to retrofit for energy efficiency a large portion of the buildings. And I'm talking about everything from a large office building, uh, such as you see in Manhattan, to residences, single family houses. There is wasted energy, heat, cooling in summer coming out of those buildings like you wouldn't, wouldn't believe it. To retrofit those can be self-supporting because you wind up spending less on energy and less on fuel. And it can also create jobs. And it can create a lot of jobs and it takes over a decade to do that. So there's a win-win example. So one of the things I think we've got to begin to talk about in this country is energy efficiency retrofit for buildings. It's win-win-win. It's jobs, it's economic growth, it's neighborhood jobs, mm -hmm. um, and it reduces energy dependence on foreign oil. That's a lot of wins. So that, I think, may be one way to talk about climate. I think it's been a little bit of a doctrinaire, abstract issue. It's, it, I remember from when I was actively involved in stuff, it was sort of a white shoe issue. It yes. never connected itself to, That's right. yeah. And therefore, it sort of became, you know, it wasn't something you'll get around to. So it's how do you get all these people who are, you know, the fast food workers and, and the, the Mexican immigrants or the South America, all these people into jobs for this. And that makes so much sense. That's the jobs in. And yeah. you know, as well as anybody in this country, what a disproportionate political influence farmers have. Right. And people in the food industry. So that's, that's the other door of entry. Um, but we're also going to have to learn to talk about it practically and perhaps as a sort of insurance policy. Maybe you don't have to be totally convinced that all the scientists who say mm -hmm. global warming is happening, but it's a serious enough risk that maybe you ought to agree to some precautionary measures. And then once we take those, maybe that's something that the, that the center and, can agree And with. then you also accelerate the development of other ways of producing energy. Yes. So that's and more get, new jobs. And then you get an economic interest tied to that. So right. actually what you're doing is you're providing jobs for the whole range of the population. That's correct. From people who are very skilled in something to people who aren't so skilled. You know, this country, it's like a Ronnie, career ladder into energy business. Career ladder yeah. is good. And this yeah. country has grown economically and hitched its wagon to various kinds of transitions. How about the transition from the horse and buggy to the automobile? Mm -hmm. How about the transition to the computer in the digital age? Mm -hmm. Well, you just said it. The next era is going to be the era of energy efficiency, because you're not going to be able to win if you waste everything anymore. That's a train we're not yet on. and We better, we better get on that train. And it can produce jobs, and we'll lose jobs if we don't do it. So when you were in Texas, did you find conservatives who didn't believe in this? I did find some. And uh, did you convince them? I don't, you don't convince them in one night, but I had deliberately asked some friends to make sure we invited some students. Okay. And the students are more open-minded. Mm -hmm. And most of the conservatives 
who opposed me on climate change were, <clears throat> say you and I, who are on Medicare, where shall we say, in the Medicare set. Mm -hmm. And they were absolutely rigid. They clearly listened to nothing I'd said. But then some of the students got up. And what I attempted to do was build a bridge from the audience between the students' concerns and their open-mindedness and some of the broad trends at work here, including this trend of efficiency and doing more with less and not having limitless resources, which is the world you and I grew up mm -hmm. You and I grew up in Ah, more yeah, oil, more mineral, whatever it is, we got right. more of it. Right. That's over. And that, it was one of those silences in the audience where s people began, well, that sort of rings a bell, limited resources. <laughs> so Did tiny you, steps for tiny things. You also talk about that we can't do this alone and, and talk about the need yes. to bring the international community That's into right. it. That's right. And then because I think you've had such experience with foundations and philanthropy, you also talk about ways of financing some of the stuff in individual countries and places, yes. which I think is fascinating. The, uh, the what is it, the, ins the Institutional Financial, whatever it is, what do you call it, the IF? I call them the IFIs, the International Financial Institutions. That's, that's just one, but that's the World Bank and their yeah. sisters and their cousins. And one of the things I think is right, they are still financing coal projects in some places, mm. and that's nuts. Um, Actually, some of the people who want them to do that, they come forward and say, well, it makes a lot of economic sense. And my answer, did you say they make economic sense? Well, then go do it in the private market. Mm -hmm. Why do you need the world? The World Bank needs to be financing the transition you and I were talking about to a low carbon, high efficiency So how do you economy. affect that? Well, they've got to wrestle with that. And that's a policy decision they have to make. Now, the, the U.S. has put some pressure on them. They've made some steps forward. China and India, everybody's got to know, within those banks are solidly against moving away from coal. They are arguing for more coal projects every day, and we've got to call them on it. In the, in the international meetings, China and India put on their, you know, their halos and say, we're for efficiency and renewables. Well, inside mm -hmm. the IFIs, the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, they're keeping they the door open for financing the dirtiest form of energy on the planet. It's incredible. It's now, a tough one. Let me give you one word of reassurance, though, on that international. Reassurance is too strong. Hope. You and I are used to these COPs, these conferences of the parties with 192 countries. Right. You know how many places you need to make the deal? Seven. There are Where? seven geopolitical countries and areas that put out about 80% of the oh. carbon dioxide. Uh -huh. So let's focus on those so what seven. Are they? they are the U.S., Europe, China, India, Brazil, Russia, problem these days, uh -huh. and the last one nobody ever gets, it's Indonesia. And it's complicated, but not only are they chopping down their forests, their forests, very many of them have a peat base, you know, like peat yeah. bogs yeah. and this kind of moss. And a peat bog has 10 times the carbon of a normal forest. So Indonesia's in the something. top seven. Now, when I break it down like that, Europe's there. Europe's ready to do it. China's the most complicated one. If we could make a deal with China, which I think is not well, impossible. And they're beginning, they have such problems. They've got a huge problem. Yeah. They've got a huge economy. And they understand the road to efficiency. That part they right. understand. They just don't understand the coal. <laughs> and they don't understand why we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. Yes, <laughs> but they swear, they say, I've had a guy, a Chinese senior official, and he said, do you Americans know something we don't know? Why aren't you cutting back on carbon? So interesting. And the, the Russia question is so connected to all of this yes. discussion. I mean, so what do we do about that? Um, <laughs> on, in the present situation, I think you try and make a deal with China, uh -huh. Brazil, Europe, I maybe so. India. Now, when I put it like that, I hope it doesn't sound hopelessly impossible. You may begin with a sector everybody agrees on. You know, China could agree on that building sector real fast, couldn't they? Mm -hmm. They want more efficient right. buildings. They don't want to overheat those buildings for 20 years. Remember, China is an energy importer. It worries them sick. They're going to have to import energy forever. So maybe you begin with the building sector, which globally is a, would be a trim. Europe will go for it because of the jobs. Mm -hmm. they're, they're still caught in the recession. 
Uh, Brazil has done more to cut their carbon dioxide than any other country by really slowing down deforestation in the Amazon. Hats off to them. So there is an interesting group of four or five of that big seven. So maybe you get to Russia last. <laughs> so you're cornered. That's right. right. And they have to do it. That's right. It's so interesting because when you think about this, it's so connected to everything we do. Now, Mayor de Blasio wants to build all this housing. Are the safeguards set in New York City for that kind of building? That's my question, too. Are they? Are they going to be really near zero carbon building? Mm -hmm. They've got to be. Right. They've got to be. There's one other group here that has to change in our country, and that's the utilities. Mm -hmm. But I'm going, to ask, I'm going to tell you another question I love to ask audiences. I say <laughs> to the audience, do you think there's any place in this country where per capita electricity use hasn't gone up in 35 years? dead silence. And then some wise yeah. ass says, well, how about Green Bridge, Vermont? He's imagining <laughs> some hippie town. Right. The answer, Ronnie, which we don't seem to understand, there is a place in this country where per capita electricity has not gone up in 35 years, and it's the entire state of California. Isn't that so interesting? a lot to be learned there. Right. The rest of the so country. So what is there to be learned there? What's to be learned is to what, do what's called uncoupling. You say to the utilities, we're not going to pay you on volume. We're going to pay you more if you get your customers to use less. Now, they moan, they groan, they said, oh, it's going to cause a depression. I haven't noticed that California... So what did they do? You know what they did? Yeah. They created two tiers of rates. You want the higher rate, Ms. Uh, utility yeah. CEO, you get your customers to use less. We don't care how you do it. Finance new icebox, they did that. Insulate their roof, they did that. Give them a new boy, give them... They did all of that and they qualified for the, for the higher rate that you get when you sell your customer less. Now, does their customer get just one bill? Yeah. It's all blended into one bill. See, so see, that's they not made it true here, is it, in no, New York? They made it the utilities problem. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Gave them all sorts of ideas that you figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And they did it. So here, what do we do? It's a mess. Here, if I, your utility, we're still paying. The more you sell, the more you earn. That's the problem. Right. And we've got to pay you for selling less. And, I mean, our building, I live in a rather large building, there are three different charges or something. I right. don't understand it. It's the original charge from Con Ed, then it's a transportation charge that they call, I can't, and we'll have to come back to this. there's also, there's a service charge yeah. that in effect yeah. is going to the state. It's just, but the whole thing is just such a mess. That's what the problem the is. The core of it is simple. Mm -hmm. Pay the utility for efficiency, not for selling as much as they can. So Works. Now let's get to the, that's a, it's very interesting. So have you talked to legislators and stuff I've, like that in this state, the I've, governor? I've talked to a few. Certainly uh, <laughs> we've proposed some of that yeah. in, the, in this state. I would yeah. say nobody's moving like grease lightning on it. Who does the proposing? That's when I want to come back down to. Who has to lead this one? Oh, the yeah. governor has to yeah. lead this one in New York. But how do we get the governor? That's what we come, all this comes back down to the students that you said were interested. It's where do you get political action because we know in this country that's how you get things done. Well, I have a lot of hope in the next generation, yeah. the students, the 30-year-olds, because they think differently than the older generation. And you and I have seen they've won a few national, the next generation mm. has won a few national elections, didn't they? Yep, they did. And so there's no reason they couldn't make an impression. And you think Andrew Cuomo doesn't understand that, doesn't count where the votes are? Yeah. And if you had a suppose in this state, which you know well, Ronnie, you had a group of, of students and under 35s pressing f just for what we're talking about, changing the way you pay for your electricity bill in Nassau and Suffolk. <laughs> you know the role Nassau mm -hmm. and Suffolk play mm -hmm. in New York elections. Mm -hmm. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. You don't have to organize the whole state. But the environmental groups also nationally now, there has to be... Put, that's that word coalition, which you always get so tired of hearing. But all of these groups that are working for fundamental change in communities have to bring the environment in to be one of their core issues. They do, and they have to relate it to the economic health yes, of their communities, absolutely. which the environmental groups haven't always right. done, yeah. as you know. Yeah. So let's just talk. We have just a few minutes. Local issues, uh, like fracking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fracking's a tough one because the potential damage to the water supply is so great. So let's follow the old rule. Is it being done safely anywhere? Yes, it is. Let's remember, fracking has been done for three decades for oil wells. Mm -hmm. 
Now, it's not exactly the same thing because a lot of the natural gas that they want to frack for is in less stable rock formations. But it means there are models out there of how to do it safely. So there is no excuse for not putting in, in every state and, every, and nationally, the toughest regulations you can imagine. Is that a difficult thing to do? Politically, right now, it seems to be. Um, and the president faces that nationally. He faces it nationally, which is why I think it's probably got to begin with the states. And the Keystone Pipeline? I'm going to shock my environmental friends. And say you're in favor of it? No, I think it may not really be that relevant. Oh, that's they don't build Keystone. They're going to dig up the oil from the tar sands yeah. and send it to China, and China's mm -hmm. going to burn it. So the answer, you for me, I, I like the people who are opposing it. The answer is not to find one piece of one pipeline in one country and say changing that is going to change the whole game. You said earlier, Mm -hmm. We're all in it together internationally, mm -hmm. and that's where we ought to be putting our effort. Are you, did you ever regret that you never ran for public office? I did a little because all of us have thought of it. You know we've all thought of it, and I'm going to tell you a story we won't go into now. Once Mario Cuomo, Cuomo asked me to be his lieutenant governor, and I said yes. Oh. And that's, the and story went downhill from there. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, I'm sorry you didn't, so thanks, Peter Goldmark, very much for this. And I hope you come back again because we've got more to talk about. It was fun. It really was fun. Thank really. you. Thanks very much. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.